Hi, I'm Mark, producer of Roundtable, the TV series born here in New York City at the legendary Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios. The exchange of ideas is important, and that is why we bring to you the following presentation. Please watch. Single shot show at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Today we uh, was invited to one of the most interesting galleries in uh, New York City, Manhattan Salomon's Art by its owner Rodriguez. And uh, we have with us two of uh, probably oldest friends of the gallery, <laughs> beautiful photographers, Lynn and Robert Bianchi. And uh, we wanted to speak about uh, how gallery influences the artist and how the artist influences gallery. Uh, work of Lynn and Robert is beautiful example of photographic art and my personal favorite of Lynn's uh, uh, nudes of the overweight, uh, overweight females, but we probably will get to talk about it a little later. And Robert is a brilliant photographer who recently created completely unusual and uh, very special photograph of the elephants. We'll ask you about this work and uh, also we'll probably try to see how your development as the artist was uh, influenced by the gallery. So, Rodrigo, why wouldn't uh, we start with learning a little bit about Salomon's art? As I understand, the origin of the gallery was in one way or another somewhat an accident. It started very spontaneously, correct? Uh, correct. Uh, we've been here I moved here in 1972, and um, at that time there was the artist Alan Shields, who was with uh, Paula Cooper, and um, so along the lines there was a lot of artists that lived in the neighborhood that did work, and um, this was a gallery basically all the time, um, an artist studio, and um, eventually we were open as a gallery because we have so many artist friends that show their art at the gallery without any uh, compromise, you know? It was just artists for artists. So it was basically a friendship came first and gallery came later. That's actually exactly. fascinating. Yeah. Usually it's if happening at all, happening vice versa. First the gallery opens, then it gets the connections, people started with friends. So how it started with you guys, how you started work with Salma. Uh, because uh, we met uh, Gigi and Rodrigo because they were doing a, a whole compendium of artists in Tribeca. So uh, they came and interviewed us and we liked them very much and we became friends and we also showed here then. It's, uh, I'm not sure what year that was. Um. Yeah, I forgot the year, but it's yeah. been many years. <laughs> many years ago. And um, so that's how we met them, um, because they were interviewing all the artists in Tribeca. Oh, yes, the original artists in Tribeca. Pioneer artists. No. Oh. So do you remember what uh, you was working on photographically back then? Um, let's see. So do you remember the year? I think it was in the 90s, wasn't it? Or yeah, it was in the 90s. It was in the yeah. 90s. In the 90s, for me, uh, it had to be late, uh, in the later. 90s, later, yeah. The, uh, in the 90s, I started producing the heavy and white work, which you have a few examples on the wall. 1998, 1997, I did distortions in white. 1998, I was producing this work. I'm not sure if, is that the work that you first saw? Um, I saw, uh, uh, let me recall. Um, Maybe did you know? It was the gold pieces, actually. Oh, the gold pieces Yeah, this, came this, this was early work, and then you move into Yes, the, the which gold we have, pieces. Which we have some there. Yes, the, they were like um, 2007, 2008. 
I started to work uh, with gold leaf and transparency prints. Oh, that's interesting. It was uh, mixed media of uh, uh, well, the the digital age came in. This is these are silver gelatin, the heavy and white work. The digital age came in then, and uh, they were no longer making the paper that I needed or the film or anything else. So I decided I have to get into the digital age, and the way I did it was I made silver gelatin prints. I scanned them, and then I started to print on transparency in layers, because I always liked um, sculptural feeling of, of depth, and that's how I began the well, that's digital. That's very fascinating. It's uh, really a combination of uh, digital and uh, uh, yes. analog processing. Yes, and, uh, yes. As I can see, you embraced uh, the digital photography. Well, I didn't quite embrace it. What happened was I decided that I loved um, manual cameras and I loved uh, printing. So I decided to work with people that liked Photoshop. So I worked closely with somebody, I did all the imagery and everything, and then I worked with somebody that did the Photoshop. Because when you take, uh, uh, you know, the film from the camera, a digital camera, you have to put it into a computer. To okay. make a print, you have to change tonality and color to get the yeah, feeling sure. that you want. What about you, Robert? What, uh, well, what, what it, was it was very interesting because when I met uh, Gigi and Rodrigo, Gigi was actually studying architecture at Pratt as well as managing the gallery. And their gallery was very much uh, connecting to the community. And I was an artist that was always kind of politically active in terms of uh, community and I had just completed in the 80s a whole series of when they were tearing down the West Side Highway and and uh, That's right. it was very very grounded in in what was going on in the area here and the artists living in within the Tribeca community for years I was served on the council that was trying to preserve housing for artists, the AIR Certification Council. So, uh, whereas, you know, that was very funny because uh, people had to apply to you be a certified stamped artist or you were an artist, you know. <laughs> I didn't know you need a license. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was very really funny. It was kind of, but it wasn't like a license, but it was a license to live in a loft. Otherwise, so the, ah. the housing was supposedly loft. Well, the city years ago decided that kind of artists were kind of subhuman so they didn't have to have the same living standard for for residencies in that like you could have guest space heaters which are illegal for personal residences to have the plumbing didn't have to be done a certain way the electrical didn't have to be done a certain way because they're just artists you know and they're just going to you know live in these floppy old lofts which nobody wanted to use back then, because back then, out of the 70s, you know, this was a tremendously depressed area. You could be able to buy a building here for like 40, 35, 40 thousand yeah. dollars. So, um, and so the and there were street lights, right? Yeah, there was no street lights. I couldn't get a cab to come down here. So no street lights. No street. No, it was you walk down the street. It was like black for de for blocks. You know, uh, it was serious. I mean, I would take a cab from uptown, and the cab would say, "Okay, I'll drop you at Canal Street." And I says, "Canal Street." I says. I s he says, no, 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 actually, I'll drop you at Houston Street. <laughs> and, and I says, Houston Street? And, you know, and they wouldn't come down here, and you would have to walk, I would have to walk all the way down past, because I lived on Lisbon, which is just below uh -huh. Canal Street. So it was a, a very different time. It was a time. It was a time where, you know, artists lived in the buildings, and the doors were always, always open, and people used to wander in and out of people's lofts, and you didn't know what you were going to find when you go in there, if anybody was wearing clothes or not, and it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a fun time. So, we moved, uh, yeah, it was a fun time, but it was a very interesting time, because the people in the community uh, were really, really dedicated artists. Because nobody would want to be here if they for it didn't really need the space, so 
uh, I was working as an art, artist diligently, but I was also active in, 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 in this because I was trying to preserve, because that's when the gentrification started to happen. You know, rich people saw pictures and magazines of what artists did to these spaces, and they go, huh? Wow, wow, wasn't that wonderful? I should live there, you know? So they started yes. coming down and uh, uh, taking over the place. So there was this response to, to preserve the, uh, the spaces under what was called AIR, Artists in Residence. And you weren't supposed to live here unless you could get that AIR certification. Okay. So, you had to have it. So in order to, on the panel, in order to get the AIR certification, you had to have two years of exhibition and graduated from a school with an art degree or five years of exhibition and not have the, the, the thing. So, uh, and we were tough. We, you, you know, it would have to be like a person that had to justify the use of the space. So a writer couldn't get the space, you know. Uh, a graphic artist couldn't get the space. A filmmaker rarely got the space, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so it was usually like painters, sculptors, photographers, that type of like rock solid, I can't need a loft to, to do my work, place. you know what I mean? And I just happen to be living there because I can't afford any else, place else to live. So, uh, so what happened then, the, the real estate brokers uh, started to push, try to push this and trying to get uh, buildings to sign waivers for people to be able to live in there. Okay, we won't throw you out. You know? And, uh, and but the, that wasn't enough because the, the city, if, if somebody got hit to it, they could push somebody out. They could say, you're taking a space away from an artist. So it was very funny because I used to get these real estate brokers approaching me in the streets and said, hey, I got this guy, you think it'll qualify? to be an artist, and I said, so what does he do if he's an artist? Says, well, he does gardening. I said, nah, <laughs> you know, there's no yeah. gardening going on in the lofts, you know. <laughs> oh, well, you know, and then they were kind of hinting, you know, there was one, I don't want to say the name, but there was one that was connected to a gallery, you know, and since I don't want to mention people's names, you know. He says, well, you know, we could do you a lot of good robbery, and he said, yeah, don't worry, I'm doing fine, you know. <laughs> so, uh, the, you know, this kind of stuff was going on, this kind of corruption which was going on. Whenever there's money, you know, there's corruption. So, mm -hmm. um, I, so uh, I was active in this, in this world, and then I was active in my art world, and my art constantly was changing, because I was, like I was saying, I was a street photographer for a while and doing these landscapes, and then I was doing more studio work, doing nudes and portraiture, and I was doing big paintings, and putting people inside of the paintings and uh, making these, and I, and I got pretty hot for a while, and then I almost died. I got very sick, and about 20 people copied my style and got rich. But they, <laughs> well, that's the name of the story, right? But, uh, uh, but you know, I'm, uh, the thing is about working with Rodrigo, Rodrigo and Gigi were very, you know, I liked them because they were both politically active, community active, and artist lovers. So they really wanted to encourage people to work. They really were not the kind of gallery that was only interested in the bottom line, only interested in the, the, the last style that they can make. They were supportive of artists. If they weren't making money with you, if they loved your work, it didn't matter. So that was something very admirable. And um, so, my relationship grew over the years, and we still remain uh, in a relationship with Gigi and Rodrigo, and it's a, a wonderful kind of community-based commercial gallery. Oh, this is really an amazing place, and I never heard anybody getting so many compliments in gallery world. They, we you know, these were, there these and were factories, it. but abandoned factories, actually, yeah. when we moved in. So across the street from us, we didn't need shades on the windows. We lived on the fourth floor, and nobody was there. So it was the street below, but we didn't have, and there were huge windows. So we had no curtains in any window. In fact, we made huge windows in the bathroom and in the back, because we had light here and light on the back. We walked around any which way, because nobody was on Canal Street, and it didn't matter. And then when it did matter, we didn't change either, except for the front where, where we had curtains. Oh, that's fascinating. So was it helping with uh, your photography? I oh. mean, 
big windows alone, I'm pretty sure. Well, right. you know what? When I was doing the heavy and white work, factory people moved in across the street. But I was used to nobody across the street. Huh? So there was, there was the Chinese people total. <laughs> Chinese yeah, it people. was quite a show. And, and, and the factory doing the things that they did in the 1900s, we couldn't believe that the factories really didn't change anything. But except that I was doing all these nude shoots and we would look up. <laughs> Actually, nobody minded. <laughs> and, yeah, it was very funny because the, 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 they were all like, was, they were sweatshops. And it was all Chinese women like mm -hmm. working at machines. Yeah. Right? But they knew what was going on across the way. I mean, we had nudes running, you know, naked people running around like all the time. <laughs> and, uh, so they would act like nothing. They would look like they were, but, they were, but every once in a while, right, we would see like little, you know, at the edge of the bin, when you look, eyes pop up like this, you know what I mean? And it would be like three or four of these women sitting there, like that, like looking, like what's going on? <laughs> so it was very funny. It was funny. Well, I'm pretty sure it was quite a show for them, uh, especially if uh, you was already working on this uh, series. I was working on the series yeah, when Because uh, one thing is to see uh, nude models to be photographed, another thing is to have uh, especially back then, uh, such unconventional uh, approach to uh, models' body. And I just wanted well, to mention know, that... I was talking about body image, and which always affected me, because even if a woman's gorgeous, there's always something, usually, that she's not pleased about her body with. Positive. And always this fat and thin, thin thing I grew up with, with it. You're too fat, it's adjustable, you're too thin, whatever. And and then I got very interested after I went to a museum, which I won't talk about, which I won't mention, where they had um, tables and tables full of garbage. Then I went to another museum at the same time, and they had all the Impressionist paintings mm -hmm. and, and tables full of beautiful fruits and everything, which was the infamous for me thinking about um, eating and body image. Indeed. Well, I personally believe that uh, what is happening in our society right now in terms of the female body image is the healthiest and the best thing yes. we are going through. Uh, we all know that uh, what is right now known as a model look is actually a result of greed of uh, fashion and uh, cosmetic companies essentially, plus all the companies that are specifically dealing with dieting who shall remain nameless and shame, shameful for the rest of eternity. But uh, right now we really see that uh, the world is catching up as you vision in a way. People really realizing that uh, it's what animates uh, a person is what is beautiful. And uh, if you talk about art, it is created from uh, the image of what the person is, not what anybody else telling this person should look. And that, in my personal opinion, is exactly what this series is about. Well, I liked it too because nobody was really, I had a task to do. They were all going to eat something. So everybody was right next to each other. And nobody really looked at anybody awry or not awry. You know, they all had this thing to do and they all sort of worked together. And the heavy woman became the star. And without the heavy woman, it wouldn't have been so interesting. I understand this one over here is actually where the whole series has started, right? The, yeah, uh, well, actually, what happened is I said, Robert, I'm, I'm going to do table settings. I need um, a heavier woman to photograph. Can you help me find somebody? And then what I did was I, um, I had them nude, not really to present... So I was teaching out of Long Island, and this was a student out at, at Long Island University, and when she was walking down the... Call, I said, oh, perfect model for my wife, you know, so I approached her and she says, oh, I do that all the time. I'm in the photography department, so let's, uh, we... And we, so he we're, brought we're, me Anne-Marie, who I always saw as beautiful, you know, I never saw as, I saw her as beautiful because I can't really photograph people that I don't find attractive. Huh? And actually, I, I interviewed everybody about body image and how they felt. Some people even gave up bulimia after doing these shoots because when you see everybody together doing all these things together, it's, it makes it sort of oh, wow. normal in the world. I, I, I actually have uh, put rubber on all their hair, so, on all their heads, so that um, 
you wouldn't see the individual, you see the concept. Indeed. Well, you know, uh, it's absolutely indeed beautiful work, yeah, and it's uh, actually a very interesting and beautiful detail that uh, people actually started to feel bad about them. Oh, so much like, better. Um, but they, about this work became apart. much more popular in Europe, in Europe than, I mean, and she did Asia. very well with them here. She was with Yossi Milo and, and, uh, and uh, the galleries, and she made a lot of money here with these. But in Europe, they were much, much, much more, more open. readily um, accepted, and they traveled everywhere in Europe. Yeah, and, I, and even Dietz Seid gave her like four pages or something mm -hmm. once. And uh, I found in Europe Germany. much more open. And this was in 1998, 1999, 2000, 2000. That Europe was much, and Asia was much more open to looking Japan, at what and mean, Japan. Yeah. No, Japan. I was in Taiwan too. Oh yeah, um, Taiwan. Was into body image, whereas in America, if it went to like California, it was like not interesting well, at that time. America in the 90s was going through a very special phase. There was just way too many people trying to sell something to a woman, mm -hmm. uh, playing off of her insecurities about the body. So that's probably why it all happened. Well, you know, a lot of people, my concept wasn't sexuality actually, although people think Absolutely. it was, but it really wasn't. It was a play on food and and wow. um, and how people feel about their bodies. For me, it looks like a pure joy of life, uh, mm -hmm. very little connected to the sexual aspect. Probably just as much as ev every day is life person is connected to sexual aspect, not more, not less. It's yes. part of life, but not anymore. But also, like when you see a lot of naked people together, like it becomes like okay. You're heavy, I'm um, too fat here, I'm um, thin here. And it wasn't about the individual. It was more like, here we all are. And so so it is, yeah. you know. Well, I see some influence of uh, classical painting, but I can't pinpoint uh, yeah, what classical. is dominating it. So would you yeah. like to share with me what was actually the influence from classical well, painting? Well, you know, I don't have that original image here. I actually saw it out of the image, but it was called the Leak. And Lalit was based on, uh, on this crystal that I got the impetus for this from Lalit crystal. They had a big vase um, and women were around the vase. And so I said to myself, I'm going to do this with women eating spaghetti. And so that's, and, and, but actually the woman eating spaghetti at the top was my first image from the series and my cat Love to be in photographs, and she decided to join her. I can tell that, and yes. that's definitely so, part of the beauty of this very first one. So that was one. So, uh, so was this uh, series originally displayed in Solomon's art as well when it was uh, in progress, or it uh, came here? Later? The next one. Uh, this. Oh, so oh this. Uh, well, we have shown um, Lynn and, and Robert. Um, group shows, solo shows, and her work is fascinating. Those, um, well, they both different photography, obviously, but you know, it is painting with the lenses, painting with the light, you know. Mm -hmm. That looks like a painting, very evocative, very beautiful images, and very suggestive. I mean, it's an incredible work. As Thought, for, probably, as yeah, for Robert, you know, we have the elephants there, yeah, well, and uh, he does monumental work as well, you know, she was talking about the West Side series, which is quite interesting, you can see it at our uh, RC uh, website, and um, so, he did both this. fascinating photographers. Yeah, and then I think we're going to be doing a follow-up, and maybe at the studio, and you'll be seeing yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, definitely need to look deeper in what you guys was doing all this time, and uh, during one show, we can't even scratch the surface, but let me ask a question. Uh, as I understand, this elephants uh, is one of the newest works uh, well, the, 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 when uh, I moved into doing digital photography, this was uh, one of the, you know, the digital photography was more about, uh, it was very conceptual and it was more about moving through different realities. And uh, I once heard a lecture that uh, a, per, a person, t uh, a, a physicist talking about planes of reality and how we could be existing on one plane of reality 
and there could be another plane ex existing right in the same spot or, you know, piled up on top of each other, multiple planes of reality, yeah. and we would never know they were there. And he, he made this funny, he says, he says, there could be a herd of elephants walking right past you right now, and you wouldn't know it, you know? So, when I took a, 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 a trip to Bali, I went to an elephant park and I was doing pictures of elephants and, and then the, the idea of that, this herd of elephants walking right past me and I wouldn't even know it came to my mind. So I started taking uh, groups of elephants together. That's not just, I didn't have a herd of elephants walking they get past me. I, I montaged them inside the, the computer. But I, the idea of like the herd of elephants rushing past you uh, in a different reality uh, at a moment, and, and and I wanted to create an atmosphere that they could be like in a different reality. So that's why they're kind of a, like uh, coming out of a mist, coming out of an ether of uh, something other than what is really right next to you. So that was the you know the purpose for that fascinating walk. I personally uh, a big believer in. Uh questioning reality being exactly what digital photography in many ways uh, make possible for photographers on one side and what becomes to be a very important part of what we're doing for many reasons including uh, an availability of rather simple but easily obtainable cameras around so uh, we definitely should go a little deeper in this discussion but I just wanted to mention this particular work well and talking about parallel reality going on at the same time right next to each other that's uh, reminded me of what you was talking about Tribeca there was this modern beautiful city going yeah. right a few blocks away and this completely unusual uh, art community found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark for Roundtable. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye.